Hello, this is Dr. C for another psychology lecture. And we're going to continue with chapter two, psychological research. So we'll call it part two. And it's possible that my microphone might be picking up the my alma mater, my high school marching band practicing in the parking lot not too far from here. So if you hear it, just pretend it's background music for my lecture. I couldn't wait for them to finish practicing. And who knew these band members have so much stamina? They just keep going and going. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. All right, let's go. I already had my coffee. I'm good. All right. So last time we talked about a few research methods used in psychology where the limitation was that we could not say that one causes something to happen, cause and effect, right? Especially when it came to correlations. And do you remember the category of those studies? Those are descriptive studies, right? They describe behavior. They don't try to demonstrate something caused something else to directly happen, okay? But now we're going to talk about experiments today. And with the experimental method, a scientist can demonstrate that something can directly cause something or cause a direct change in something else, right? Especially if you're studying medicine. Did this treatment directly cause someone to feel better? or to remove their disease. Could be a teaching method. Did the addition of long-winded PowerPoint narration videos improve student grades? Okay, that could be an experiment. Now, from this point forward, I don't want you to equate the word experiments with study, right? A lot of people throw around the term, oh, I read in the book about a psychology experiment. They throw out the word experiment kind of loosely when they really mean that I was reading about a psychology study or a piece of research because the word experiment is a very specific category of research. It's a type of method. Okay, So not all psychological studies are experiments. Okay, but it is a kind of research method, a very important one. And you might guess that being able to say when you're done with a study <clears throat> that something I introduced had a direct effect on something I'm measuring. That's very powerful, right? A lot more powerful than a correlation which basically says that, well, when this happens, this also happens. Or maybe this happens, causing this to happen, right? We weren't sure of the direction of the causality, but a scientific experiment, we can do that. All right, so first we have to start off with a hypothesis, okay? Well, we have to start with the research question. What is it that we want to study, right? And then we design the experiment. All right, so let's go ahead and create an example of what we want to study, what the research question is. And let's just do something really simple so it doesn't sound too complicated. Um, maybe something everyone can relate to, like a drug type study, right? So let's say, um, oh, okay. Uh, You've heard of the supplement ginkgo biloba, right? An herb. Those who sell this supplement claim that it can improve memory. So that's our research question. Does giving people, giving someone ginkgo biloba affect their memory? That's our research question. 
Now we could do this as a correlational study, if you remember how to do that. Giving people a survey, ask them, you know, do you take herbs like ginkgo biloba? Right, you can even give them a memory test if you want, okay? How is your memory? And then you find a relationship between the two. But because it's descriptive, you're only describing people who are either taking it or not taking it. You did not actively give a group of people this supplement. You cannot claim that the supplement directly caused memory improvement, if that's what you found. But let's design, design an experiment about this, okay? So the essential design of an experiment is to compare two or more groups of individuals or subjects we can call them volunteers to be nice and give one group something which is usually what you want to test and we'll call them the experimental group All right they're the focus of the research question so in our example is going to be the ginkgo biloba supplement like a pill okay and maybe and this part we can make up we will follow this group of people 30 days. Could be a year, it doesn't matter. Okay, but the basic component of research is that you have to compare it to something. You can't just give one group of people you've selected, ginkgo biloba, measure their memory before and after and claim that ginkgo biloba works. Okay, well let's examine that. Why can't we do that? What if you just had group A, the experimental group, you gave them ginkgo biloba, right? And let's say you give them a memory test here and a memory test here, and they've been taking ginkgo biloba for four weeks. I know my handwriting is really bad. Okay. Okay. So you have test one, test two, and my goodness, the test scores went really high. Why can't we say? that ginkgo biloba directly caused memory improvement. Well, even though we did hand people ginkgo biloba and there's no comparison group, there's no group B or group C, the reason we cannot say that ginkgo biloba directly caused memory to improve is because there are other confounding variables Right? Think about all the things that one encounters in their daily life that could also improve memory. Maybe it's in their diet. Maybe they got a lot of sleep during those four weeks. Right? Almost anything about their life could have contributed to an improvement from time testing number one and test period number two. Right? So in an actual experiment, you need a control group, a comparison group. They do not experience the manipulated variable. Right? Oftentimes, you would have two control groups, one group that basically has the same relative same experience as the experimental group. They just don't take the ginkgo every day. But then you may want a third group that takes a placebo, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Placebo is a pill made to look like the real thing, but it's made of a substance like sugar that doesn't have any taste and doesn't have any real effect. It's like a fake pill. It's a fake treatment. We'll talk a little bit later about why that's necessary. All right, the act of giving this experimental group ginkgo biloba pills, that's called manipulation. In every experiment, there's a manipulation of the variable. And all that simply means is that I'm gonna give one group something and not give it to the group, to the control group. That right there is manipulation. That kind of experimental, experimenter intervention does not exist in descriptive studies, right? by asking people in a survey or interview what kind of things they eat, how is their memory, there's no intervention there. You're not giving one group something that affects their lives and giving another group something else or withholding it from another group. You're merely measuring what people already are doing. That is more passive. So think of an experiment as more active for the researcher. There's active intervention and active control. All right, so here's a key term before we continue. So we know that we're gonna gather a group of volunteers 
put them into two groups, right? Give one group ginkgo biloba and not give it to the other group and maybe give another group a fake, pi fake pill that looks like ginkgo, right? Operational definition. Everything we study has to be defined, right? So we have two variables. We have ginkgo, that's variable number one, and memory is the second variable. How does the first variable affect the second one? So an operational definition is just a measurement, right? How are we going to measure these variables? And we'll, we'll talk about what this is, dependent and independent variables in a moment. I believe it's on the uh, uh, one of the slides coming up. Let me skip ahead real quick. Yeah, it's defined over here. Okay. All right, so let's go back here. And so an operational definition basically is how do we measure something that we're uh, we're using in the study. So ginkgo biloba, right? How do you how do you measure that? How do you give it a number? Well, a lot of medications and supplements come in grams, and there's a milligram measurement or number of pills. Okay, so you can talk about the amount. That is an operational definition of ginkgo biloba. How do we operationally define memory? You can't just ask them, hey, is your memory memory good <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, right? Well. Technically, you could do that, but that's not a very good test. So you give them a more standardized, maybe a paper and pencil test. And whatever score they get, that score, that number, is an operational definition of memory. Okay, So every variable has to be defined in a way that we can measure it with a number. And that's an operational definition. All right. So here are a couple terms, and I'll talk mostly about these right here, the blind study, okay? It doesn't have to occur in all kinds of research, but especially research where a medicine is involved that, or some sort of treatment, then a blind and double blind uh, makes a lot of sense, okay? So a single blind study is where the researcher and all those research employees and assistants, they know that they're handing an experimental group ginkgo biloba and giving the control group nothing or a placebo, okay? And you can tell that, well, maybe that's not the best design because isn't it possible that if you know which treatment you're giving this subject, it could affect how you behave towards that subject. And if you behave differently, to one group, group A, and behave a different way to group B, the difference in your behavior as a researcher could influence the results of the study. Remember, in an experiment, you want these both groups of individuals to have as much of a similar experience as possible throughout the study, except for one thing, and that's one group getting ginkgo and the other group getting a placebo, right? Everything else has to be generally equal okay so a way to remedy that is by creating a double blind study so uh, i'll back up a second a single blind who's blind in this study it's the participant right it's the volunteer they don't know what they're taking okay and the reason that you cannot tell them what they're taking is because of the placebo effect right sometimes having a strong belief or expectation that you're taking a treatment even though you're really not, can influence your behavior or your mindset, okay? It's as if you are taking the real thing. And the placebo effect is amazing because you can find it in many kinds of studies where a drug that's being tested is no more effective than a placebo. And a placebo may show effectiveness greater than not taking anything, okay? So the, so the placebo effect is still kind of a mystery to many psychologists, um, they don't know exactly at the biochemical level why that is, that you're not actually having that drug in your body, but yet by believing you're taking something, you're getting the benefit of that. Okay, so the power of belief is very good. A bit, I mean, it's very strong. So a double-blind study means that in addition to the volunteer or subject not knowing which one they're taking, they just know that they're getting pill A or pill B, right? So they don't know which is which. They look the same and they're not told. The researcher handling the treatment 
does not know. Okay, And we did research like that at MD Anderson. We gave people medication along with the patch and different kinds of smoking cessation studies. I've talked about that before. right? And if I was the research assistant meeting in person with the subject who's coming in for their maybe their weekly dosage of medications and patches right even the patch can be faked okay it could just be a non-medicated patch that the person handing it to them does not know what is a and what is b okay but there's only one person who knows and that's the person way at the top who has access to the top secret folder that labels which letter is which drug whether it's A or B, right? Everyone from that person down who's working and having direct contact with subjects, they are blind as well. That's why it's called double blind. All right, so there's a picture of a few examples of what placebos look like, okay? All right. Um, I shouldn't tell you this, but a long time ago um, with my mother-in-law, I was tempted to replace her bottle of Advil with mini M&Ms. <laughs> okay, I know that's unethical, and, and that is something we'll talk about later about ethics. Because I thought, you know, is it possible someone who takes medicine for pain, just the act of hand to mouth taking something, will believe that they're feeling better? Now, if it takes on average 30 minutes for an oral medication to have an effect in the bloodstream, and someone is claiming that after 15 minutes their headache is getting better right that might be a placebo effect so you may want to observe that whether in yourself or other people around you sort of time it when someone's starting to take a medicine and see if uh, they're experiencing a placebo effect in terms of a instead of a biochemical effect all right here we go again in psychology two more terms that look almost the same that you have to try to remember the independent dependent variable okay now a lot of students get confused because they think that going back to a correlational study that has two variables that they can label one of them independent and the other one dependent no there's a directionality to this okay so these these terms only apply to experiments the independent variable is whatever that thing is that's being controlled and manipulated by the experimenter. So in this case, is the ginkgo biloba pill. Right, that is our independent variable. Okay, the independent variable is almost always going to be some sort of treatment or the new thing that's being tested in an experiment. Okay, that's one way to remember it. The dependent variable is what the researcher is measuring in terms of what effect did the independent variable have so the other variable is memory right so what effect did giving people ginkgo biloba have on their memory i'm very visual so i made this diagram years ago i learned it from a professor and that's all you need to see iv then draw an arrow to the right followed by a dv the independent variable is the variable that, that's the question mark in, in the middle. Does it cause a direct change in the dependent variable, right? So if you only remember that and then refer to any experiment that's being described to you, like say in a test question or you read an article about an experiment in the news, the independent variable is always going to be the treatment. So it's whatever drug that's being tested. Or maybe it's a, uh, some, 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 or maybe it's a vaccine, right? And what is it trying to treat? That's the dependent variable. What is it trying to affect? Something about our health, blood sugar levels, whatever. In our case, right, we're talking about memory. That's how you label the two, okay? So in this example they use in the slide, they're talking about the independent variable, whether watching violent television is gonna have an influence in increase in aggressive behavior, right? And that is an experiment that could be done, of course, very carefully. You don't want to show something that's too gruesome or violent to people who are kids who are too young, for example. Right? So it has to pass a certain standard. But how would you set that up, right? Well, you would give one group the opportunity to watch that particular film, then have some sort of measurement, maybe through observation of 
aggressive behavior after watching that film. Maybe place them in a room, have them do a puzzle that's very frustrating and see if it increases their aggressive actions. And then the control group would watch a different kind of video that has much less violence in it and see what their behavior is doing the same task, right? And that's a very doable experiment. Okay, so uh, we have independent dependent variable. Okay, now what we didn't see before, and I'm gonna skip over this a little bit because these are just very simple terms. Oh, I could spend a couple minutes discussing this, right? In an experiment like this, where there's active manipulation and you're trying to test something like ginkgo, you need live people. Okay, we'll call them participants or volunteers or subjects. Okay, well, the word population has to do with the group of people you're interested in learning about, right, or testing this on. So for sometimes, for some experimenters, it's children, for other experimenters, it's women. And for other experiments, there's seniors testing an Alzheimer's drug, right? So what is that group that you're testing? That's called the population in general. Now, that could be millions or billions of people, so there's no way to study the real population, even an entire college campus. That's not possible. So that's too large for a researcher to include, so you, can, you do a sample. Just like when you go to Costco, and they can't give you the whole pizza for free, but you can take a little piece. Right? less than a slice <laughs> to taste. That's the same same idea here. You take a sample from that population, a subset of individuals, right? And that number can be derived through statistics. Like what's the optimal number? We don't have to get into that at this level. You know, whether it's 100 volunteers or 200, sometimes the more, the better, statistically speaking. But usually you have to have a minimum number. You can't just have three in one group and two in the other. That's not enough. So Statistically speaking, you want to have a minimum number of in your sample. Now, what's not mentioned here is that ideally you want to have a representative sample. You can probably guess what that means, right? It means that your sample of, let's say, 100 should, in a way, look like the population. So if the population is half men, half women, your sample should be 50-50, right? Uh, and it should... If you're looking at only college student populations, then okay, your sample should be made up of college students. Is there a breakdown of ethnicity? Should you should you look at that? Okay, so uh, psychology used to be criticized because back in the day, when and most psychology experiments were done on university campuses, and most of the students studying psychology were white males, that many people joked about as a criticism that psychology was was based on research on white males. So it's really the study of white male psychology, right? Because one of the downsides of doing that kind of research, whatever it is you're doing, whether it's about aggression or personality, is that how can you possibly take that data and generalize it and say, well, this, this pattern of behavior applies to everyone. You can't really say that if your sample is not representative, right? Okay, so... We're backing up here, and, and, and I really wish I could have redone these slides to do a better order because this comes first, right? When you, you want participants, you want a sample, you want to get a random sample. That's basically a way of choosing the participants, okay? Um, you cannot just choose them from one particular location or one particular classroom or one particular part of town, right? Then it won't represent the population unless you're specifically studying that neighborhood. Okay, so that's what a random sample means. Oh, by the way, in political polling, nationwide polling, let's say for a presidential race, that's that's ideally what they want to do too, is a random sampling of the American population, you know, a mix from a wide variety of places. Okay, now random, let's say we have our 100 people, right? We, we found them throughout the college campus. We're studying college students. A very important part of any experiment is random assignment. Oftentimes, if you read a description of a study that's done, let's say in an article in the news, you may see this thrown in there. And if you see the term randomly assigned, okay, these participants were assigned, then you know fairly certain that this is an experiment. Because an assignment is an active method. It's an active thing that an experimenter needs to do. So I have a sign-up sheet of 100 names. I'm going to assign them. Remember, we have 
two or three groups. Let's just narrow it down to two groups, right? The experimental group, they're going to get ginkgo, biloba, and the control group, and they're going to get a placebo. Okay, we're going to have two groups in our example. You can have more than two, right? Um, and so, well, how am I going to create these two groups of 50 from my list of 100? Um, what if I just did it alphabetically so that from 1 to 50, 1 to 49 or whatever, they go into one group, and then 51 to 100, they go into the second group? What could possibly go wrong? Right? That's not called random assignment. That's just first half, second half. Right? If you imagine 100 people sitting in a room, you can't just choose the front first front uh, five aisles or rows and take the people in the back, right? Put them in the control group. All of those methods of splitting a group of people into two groups is ineffective and will destroy the study. Why? Well, ideally you want to have two groups of people for comparison, two groups of subjects that are almost equal as possible, as equal as possible. When you take a group, that's split up that way, whether it's the top of the list or the bottom of the list, front of the room, sitting in the back of the room, you could, just by coincidence, have different features, different characteristics, major differences between people, let's say, sitting in the front of the room versus sitting in the back, right? You know that it's possible, don't you think, that in a, in a regular classroom setting, certain students choose to sit in the front for a specific reason? Some students sit in the back for a specific reason. What if those reasons has to be conscientiousness, right? The better students choose to sit in the front so they can be less distracted and take better notes, and those who are not as into a course sit in the back, right? So what if you do memory tests, and those who sit in the front tend to get better memory scores on that test than people sit in the back? So just by coincidence, you've created two unequal groups at the very onset of the research. And the same thing could happen on a list of names on a piece of paper. You really don't know. There's too many hidden variables that could damage the study right from the get-go. So to, the best way to create two equal groups is an old, low-tech way, is by flipping a coin, heads or tails, right? And we actually did this at MD Anderson. Fancy cancer hospital, and we flipped coins, right? Or sometimes we use a random number generator on a calculator. If it's odd, odd number, we put this person's name in group A. If it's an even number, we put them in group B. And it's a double blind study, which means what? If I were doing the assigning, I do not know what group A is or what group B is, right? I don't know which group is getting the ginkgo biloba, all right? And so flipping of the coin, each person has an equal chance. This is from the definition. Each person has an equal chance of being assigned to either group, right? Now, that sounds like a textbook definition, but basically, if you think about a coin toss, there is an equal chance, right? 50-50, heads or tails, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to get exactly 50 heads and 50 tails, but what's going to happen is whatever existing differences might be within this group, you're going to have tall people, short people, you're going to have people who are geeks and puzzle champions, you're going to have all these kinds of characteristics in the group where you don't want too many of those in one side or the other, right? It would create an imbalance when they take memory tests. But on average, if you do flip a coin, then if you had 10 people who are puzzle champions who would probably ace the memory test anyway in their sleep, maybe you'll get five on one side and five on the other and they cancel each other out, right? That's the power of random assignment is ideally you can try to create two relatively equal groups by having whatever hidden differences in the groups split up and evenly in those groups. Even if you don't know what those things are, right? You take care of it. Any kind of, it says right here, random assignment helps to avoid pre-existing systematic differences. So any of those differences between groups can said to be the result of the manipulation. Okay, that last part. Any significant differences between groups, they're talking about the memory test, okay, the dependent variable, is the result of giving the ginkgo biloba. Okay, that's that's why textbooks are horrible in some ways, right? You read that and you think, what the heck are they talking about? But that's what they're talking about. If we have two equal groups 
who have a similar experience in those 30 days. They go to the same classes, they go to the same place for lunch, whatever, you know. You can only control so much on a college campus. One group gets ginkgo every morning, the other group gets a placebo, right? And if there are significant differences in their memory scores from beginning to end and from group to group, right, then you know, well, it had to be the ginkgo. It's not anything else, okay? Because uh, nothing else, all these other variables are phased out because of the flip of the coin. All right. Now, there are some times when a researcher wants to do some sort of comparison, but they're not going to be able to do it in a traditional experimental way because, for example, if you want to compare men versus women in a study, well, you can have men and women sign up, right? You can't just flip a coin and say, okay, Joe, John, uh, John Doe, you're female because you got tails. You can't do that. You cannot randomly assign sex, right? Uh, so the independent variable here cannot be manipulated. Okay? You cannot manipulate age. Although people study those things all the time, right? They compare age groups. And the only way you can do that is either use what's called a quasi-experiment, where you are, you don't have random assignment, but you give one group something, give one group something else. Okay, so it's a little bit limited. Or you use a correlational study. Right? Where you measure, well, you measure the memory test of men, me measure the memory test of women, and see if there are any differences, right? But you cannot create two equal groups to begin with. You just have a group of men and a group of women, okay? So a lot of studies that compare the effect of male versus female, right, are not pure experiments because they're not, they're not an ideal independent variable, okay? And you cannot really make a strong cause and effect statement saying, well, what causes aggression is the fact that you're male. You can't say that, right? Um, just because you cannot design an experiment to prove that, well, men are more aggressive than women because of, of whatnot, okay? You have to measure it in a different way. And that most you can say is that men are more likely to be aggressive because of something. But you cannot say one cause the other to happen okay so a demographic variable meaning something about you whether it's your race your age your income level right those things are part of you and cannot be manipulated cannot be changed with the flip of a coin so those studies have to be measured in a different way also sometimes we cannot do experiments because of ethical concerns right so let's think about all that medical data out there saying that smoking is harmful to you. Do you think human experimental trials were done to give us that information? I was there at the hospital, right? We did experiments. But we were doing experiments on how to treat people, not to see whether or not smoking causes a disease. So we have to use correlational methods, find people, interview them, if they're a smoker or non-smoker, that's something they're already doing. So there's no ethical problem there. You're not handing people cigarettes at 13 years old and then measure them 20 years later and say, okay, come in for a chest x-ray. Let's see how you're doing compared to the other group that uh, was not smoking, right? You cannot flip a coin and force people to smoke, right? So, but that is not an excuse for you smokers out there to say that there's no solid data about the harmfulness of smoking no the harmful data came from correlational studies which are still legitimate right because if it's an overwhelming correlation then again like we talked about last time you're just playing the odds you're assuming you're not going to be part of that correlational graph okay and so studying things like child abuse or diseases or risky behaviors usually cannot be done in an experiment. You can't just flip a coin and say, hey, why don't you guys um, ride a motorcycle for a month without a helmet? Uh, for a second group, we'll flip a coin. Okay, you guys get to wear a helmet, and let's see how it goes, okay? <laughs> you can't do that, okay? Um, if you think back to World War II and the experiment, human experiments done by the Nazi doctors that were horrific, the reason that they were able to conduct them was because they threw out 
threw out the window all ethical considerations, right? The number one ethical consideration is to do no harm. Well, they didn't care about that. They wanted to experiment for the sake of experimenting to see what would happen to humans if you do this, right? And that's because they had ultimate control and they were breaking international laws to do so. All right, now let's say we've uh, conducted our study. We followed these two groups of students who were assigned randomly with a flip of a coin to an experimental control group. The experimental group took the ginkgo every day. Okay, of course, part of the experiment could go wrong if they don't take it, right? That's something to consider when you're running an experiment. Are they complying? And that's called compliance, by the way. So when you talk to your doctor next time, you know, part of the doctor's concern with his or her patients is whether or not they're complying with their medical procedures, okay, or medical advice. Anyway, we have to, let's say we get the dependent variable tests of memory at the end, okay, or over time, and we have to run a statistical analysis, which we don't do, so we're just going to magically imagine that uh, results appear. Now, how do you know? Where do you draw that line in the sand that says that, well, if if group A got this score, let's say 95 out of 100, and group B is the placebo group, and they averaged an 81, does that really tell us that uh, ginkgo was effective? You know, what if it was uh, 95 to 60? Would that say that's effective? Right? We cannot just eyeball this, okay? We cannot just assume. So statistical analyses are run that tell us that whether or not the difference between these two groups of scores, right, these averages, are different enough to not be an accident, okay, by chance, okay? Are these two numbers so close that it could have occurred by chance? That's what the statistic, statistics are telling us. Now, if the odds of these differences, let's say these numbers are this far apart, and the odds of the differences according to the statistics are about 5% or less, right? That is a very small possibility that these scores occurred by accident. Then the results are considered significant, meaning that Ginkgo indeed, right, made a difference in one's memory. Okay, we can say, yes, the study was a success. We found statistical significance let's combine significance with statistical okay and this is where the researchers start celebrating say oh we did something we found something real this drug was effective or whatnot or this drug was safe or it's better than a placebo okay all right so that's the key right you compare the two groups and their memory test scores how far apart are they well we have to use statistics to measure that and they have to be far apart to the point where these two scores and the gap did not happen by accident at a 5% chance, okay? Now, what if uh, a researcher got at 6%, right? Well, then, as an honest researcher, you have to claim that, well, we found some trends, we came close, but the results are not statistically significant. So it is possible that the differences we see between ginkgo and placebo may have occurred by chance, meaning by accident, okay? That it was not really due to taking one or the other, right? So that, that covers it from beginning to end, right? We start off with participants. We start off with a random sample, random assignment, independent and dependent variables, experimental control groups, and then looking at the statistics at the end. What did we find as a result? And something that's important to know is that most professional journals are usually read by professionals, okay? And you may have heard this term peer-reviewed, right? That means as a psychologist, if I were to do a study, before it can be published, it has to be reviewed by a group of my peers, not people I know. Well, I might know them if it's a small specialty group, right? But other psychologists who are good at research, researching in the same field, they need to read that study and pick it apart. See if there's anything that looks odd or unrealistic. They, they're going to look into the raw numbers, right? And I remember there was a case where um, 
a South Korean geneticist claimed that they cloned a sheep. Do you guys remember this? But he actually faked the data that he didn't really clone. The, and he was disgraced in public. And in some Asian cultures, you know, that, that shaming thing is very powerful. Should be put on suicide watch in those kind of situations, right? Uh, sometimes company CEOs are very shameful. They come out crying. Oh, I'm sorry, we embezzled money. You know, that doesn't happen in America, right? Uh, here we don't admit guilt to anything, even if we're caught. Um, that's for another time. Okay, so I'm not bashing America. Trust me. Okay, so the reason that we have to have peer-reviewed journal articles, and this is why you can really, most people can really trust the foundation of the process. Of creating scientific research is that it's really actually difficult to publish an article because you have all these other experts in the field that specific field examining it under a microscope okay for any flaws and whether or not you're exaggerating your results your conclusions you know you found some sort of pattern and you say oh I found this huge pattern well you can't really use words like and this is where replication comes in as part of research that many of you probably know, is that if I find that ginkgo biloba can improve memory, and, I, and that's the first study that's ever been published out there, right? would you really trust that result? If I did this study in Texas and you live in Washington, would it work for you there? Because you're in a different climate, you all may eat different things, right? You don't know that. So it's important to replicate studies to see if you come, come out with the same consistent findings. And it's possible in psychology to do 100 experiments in a similar area of other people and just copy and replicate someone's experiment at your college campus just to see if you find the same patterns and the same results. Right? So you're building evidence, strong evidence, empirical evidence right, to come up with a theory. All right, and uh, I think I'm going to skip over this, um, but I think understanding how critical and, and how scientific studies are scrutinized, right, that if you know someone or yourself who happens to believe in certain things, like whether or not uh, childhood immunizations can cause autism, look into the research right and find articles that summarize research and those are called metadata or I'm um, sorry a meta-analysis don't worry it's not gonna be on the test okay but if you find a study that's a meta-analysis what they're doing is they're gathering the conclusions of dozens if not hundreds of studies to look for patterns or to see what percentage of all the research showed that maybe uh, autism could have been caused by giving immunizations, right? And that's an illusory correlation that people believe in because almost all children get vaccinated, right? And then a small number develop autism. And so some people may see a cause and effect where none exists, where it just could just be accidental in terms of, well, it just happened. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, let's talk about reliability here. Um, these, I think, uh, fairly straightforward. Reliability just means, uh, are the results consistent over time, right? Um, if I give ginkgo to people in Texas, would it work the same in people in Idaho? Or will it work the same five years from now, right? Um, if there's a study that has to do with observers, right? Let's say you're observing children and, and who acts aggressive, right? And you give each student an aggressiveness score on a 1 to 10 scale. Oh, I think Johnny was really aggressive today. That's an 8, right? But you have three or four people rating the same child. Are they going to come up with the similar answers, right? That's called inter-rater reliability. So if you're doing that kind of research where observations involved, it's important that all these observers are able to classify events very similarly okay they have to match up now validity I mentioned last time in passing is when conducting a survey for example or any kind of measurement 
is it measuring what it was designed to measure, right? So a survey is a good example of that, okay? Um, if you're doing a survey to detect depression, are your questions written in a way that is crystal clear that everyone's going to interpret it the same way and give a consistent answer to that question? Then you can be sure that this question is valid, this survey is valid. It's actually measuring depressive thoughts, right? But what if by accident it's measuring what people are imagining or what people are dreaming about? Maybe the questions were so vague that they're just writing in answers, right? Or giving a response based on their interpretation of what they think that question means, then it's not a valid test. All right. And we can finish a little bit with, um, I'm getting a little long here, it's 45 minutes long, with research. And this is just for you to know that when research is conducted, whether it's at a hospital or at a university setting, any kind of research, doesn't have to involve medicines of any kind, even psychological studies where they're just observing people. The research cannot be conducted until it's been approved by a review board, right? And every study, you're supposed to give the subject an informed consent form, right? So they know ahead of time what kind of risks are involved, but you may remember, you've heard of some studies where, well, didn't they just trick people and they didn't know they were in this situation. They didn't know they were shocking people with electricity, you know, but they really weren't, but they thought they were. You know, what about that? Well, that's a social psych study where there was not 100% informed consent, but a review board can approve studies like that if they find that the scientific gain of knowledge outweighs the risks. If there's a very low risk, very low harm, right, then a review board can approve studies that have deception in it. If that's the only way to get to see real behavior is by deceiving. If you tell everybody up front what you're going to do, you may not find what you're measuring for, right? So deception can be used in research, but at the end, what's really important, first of all, it cannot cause harm, and at the end, subjects have to be debriefed and explained why they were tricked, what they were trying to learn, okay? And if there was stress involved, then they had to follow up with those subjects. Now, you can read about the Tuskegee syphilis study, and this was really horrible, uh, back in the 1930s. I don't have time to go through it right now, but in the black community um, in Tuskegee, they wanted to find out what happens to people, speci specifically in black men, once they catch the sexually transmitted disease called syphilis. And syphilis can be easily treated with antibiotics, but they did not treat people, right? And there was no informed consent. They did not know they were positive. They didn't know there was treatment out there, right? And uh, there, there was no treatment given to the participants at the time. And so that was a, a glaring case of um, poor ethical conduct, right? Um, where there was deception involved, they wanted to gain some scientific understanding about something, but they took advantage of a population of people that could not stand up for themselves just to learn something. So that is on the borderline as in terms of as harmful as those Nazi studies. Okay. And lastly, animal subjects. Okay. This is still very controversial. Most of psychological research, 90%, they tend to use rodents or birds, but you can make a good case that, well, just because they're rodents or birds, they perceive pain. It depends on what you want to do to them, right? Um, so this is still a very controversial subject. I encourage you to read more about it. And there are many cases where it is possible to do the research. If it's possible to do it without um, animals, without harming them, okay? Um, sometimes they want to test things on animals that would be unethical in humans. So th this is a, one of those areas that's quite tricky. No easy answers. Okay. All right. This is getting long-winded. And this is how I lectured in the classroom, believe it or not. But in the classroom, you can actually raise your hand. And uh, the downside is you can't stop me in the classroom. But 
offline, you can. Now, on the internet, you can just pause, <laughs> listen to half of this, and listen to the second half later. So that's the end of this particular video, and I'll see you guys in the next one.